Let's turn to the uh, Checkmate 057 trial, which was the companion to it, the same design of nivolumab or Obdivo versus Taxotere, Docetaxel, second line, but this in the non-squamous population. Can you tell us a bit about the results, Lena, and what, what you think they should mean for oncologists? Well, the results, I think, are really identical to the squamous population. The difference in survival is not as great, um, but that, as I think was shown by the discussant pretty clearly, I thought that was a good discussion, that um, the difference is not in the nivolumab, but it's in the docetaxel, which may perform better for adenocarcinoma. So there's less of a difference, but there's still a clear difference. There's a difference in survival. There's a difference here. There was a more clear-cut difference based on pdl one expression, and again, that might be related to differences in smoking, not, or the percentage maybe of non-smoking-related cancers in the adenocarcinoma population, or mutational burden, possibly. But I think if you looked harder at the squamous cell population, you'd see the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So, Jean-Charles, what did you think of this? And what, it, particularly about issues like pdl one expression in the non-squamous population, where there are was more of an association seen, and there was not as clear a benefit, if in fact any benefit, uh, in never smokers and those with a driver mutation. So do those issues change your thinking, or do you apply Optivo with the same level of interest in, in the non-squamous as the squamous? Well, as Nina said, there is a survival advantage, and this is important. However, I would like to draw the attention to the fact, as you say, that the, the docetaxel arm performed three months better, six months versus almost nine months of overall mm -hmm. survival mm -hmm. in uh, the non-squamous populations versus the squamous. And uh, therefore, in that setting, I really believe that a biomarker is absolutely necessary. Because when you have a comparator, as you say, which we could qualify as suboptimal, or some mm -hmm. people would call weak, which mm -hmm. is docetaxel in squamous, I think that in the non-squamous population, that comparator is really not bad in some patients. Mm -hmm. And I was puzzled by the discussion by Roy Herbs, uh, who really made an analogy uh, with the data that was presented when we uh, were using chemotherapy versus IRESA in mm -hmm. EGFR mutants, uh, TARSIVA for uh, the US. And in that uh, situation, we were having contradictory results. In some patients, huge benefits. In some patients, no benefit. And we found a biomarker, which is EGFR mutation. Well, here we also have a biomarker, because in that uh, analysis uh, presented by Dr. Paz Ares, it was extremely clear that the high pd one expressor were having huge benefit. And in that population, it's harder to argue uh, that uh, nivolumab uh, shouldn't be uh, a preferred choice. But in those who are pd one negative, there was absolutely no benefit at all. No benefit at all. And then the question comes to say, do you use nivolumab in patients who do not benefit as compared to docetaxel with the only argument which is this is better tolerated. Well, I think the jury's out there. So some doctors might want to go that path. Some others might want to say, well, you know, I mean, there is no clear benefit. So uh, maybe we can, uh, you know, save uh, that resources for other choices because the number of choices we have in the non-squamous population is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think if there's any difference between these results and IPASS, for instance, it's that in the arm that is not high expressors, you don't have a detrimental effect or a clear, better result with the other choice. Uh, the financial toxicities issue, issues are real, and I think that's, that's a factor. But nivolumab, and it's partly because of the enthusiasm around it. There's a gravitational pull that I think is going to lead uh, physicians and patients to both want to give it to most patients uh, at some point, if for no other reason than that we don't see no benefit in patients who are low expressors. And, and there are a few people who, in, perhaps inexplicably, do get a very good result. It's maybe 10% or less. but we'd hate to miss that opportunity. Not so much to defend that, but to say, I think that operationally, we're gonna see a lot of people still 
preferring Nevo at and not missing that chance. I mean, the other thing I think it is important to factor it in, that there's true, there's significant financial toxicity, but there's also significantly decreased overall toxicity. This is palliative therapy you're talking about, so quality of life is actually the overall goal. So I think in that sense, we do accept a lesser benefit and would trade the trade docetaxel for nivolumab at almost any setting. I do think, however, that PDL1 status will play an important role overall mm -hmm. in really defining, especially because of the financial burden, who are the best patients to receive this drug. Because for some of those patients with adenocarcinoma that probably affected that curve, those PDL1 negative patients, those may have been those non smoker oncogene-driven cancers where there are other potentially less toxic therapies available as well that have durable benefits. So, Jean-Charles, yeah? I um, do understand your point. Uh, nevertheless, we do have alternative options to docetaxel who are much less toxic and which are, for instance, pemetrexid in second-line setting. Not 100% of patients get pemetrexid in the front-line setting. So, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the trade-off, if, if my patient got frontline therapy, let's say carbotaxel BEV, why should I throw Nevo where I don't have data that demonstrates it's better than uh, pemetrexid? Uh, and I know that pemetrexid is much less toxic than docetaxel, and the cost of pemetrexid is much lower as compared to Nevo. So uh, while I agree with the high enthusiasm to give uh, Nevo, I will still stick to using a biomarker and in the negatives, think a little bit whether there is an option or not, because we can only bear to some extent that cost, correct? I mean, 12 weeks of nivolumab is $54,000. So I'm, I'm not sure the system is going to cope with that, because we need to have, as a society, some responsibilities, because these immune-oncology drugs are transformative across many tumor types, so the cost is going to explode. I mean, we have seen in this meeting that on top of the well-known established activity of uh, anti-PD-1s and PDL1s in, in bladder, head and neck, uh, you know, Hodgkin, as well as uh, kidney, now we are exploding. We have hepatocellular carcinoma, mesothelioma, colorectal, uh, colorectal MSI, uh, ovarian. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at some time point, even the richest countries are going to say, hello, <laughs> we are not paying. <laughs> Well, I think one other potentially minor factor is this was docetaxel without ramucirumab, and ramucirumab has not transformed the landscape of lung cancer, but did have a survival benefit, and we might envision that you would see a little better results with Ceramza added to docetaxel. So that would potentially even lean toward that as a choice over uh, Opdivo for, for the ones who are less likely to benefit. You know, I think these discussions, honestly, are worthwhile for the moment, but this is really a moving target because these therapies are being tested right now in the first-line setting. And if the results that we're seeing in the second line do hold up in the first line, where they are, there is a more rigorous adherence to biomarker selection, then it may make this discussion yes. moot. I agree with you, Lina. I mean, I was very impressed by the data presented with uh, the anti pdl one compound from uh, Genentech, mpdl 32 a which is already hard to say, but they gave them the little name of atezolizumab, <laughs> which is even more difficult to say. Uh, but We're going to uh, definitely use the marketed name, yeah, whatever that but, is. But it, it has no marketing yet. So let's call it atezo. <laughs> so atezo uh, was presented as a poster in combination with steroid-free chemotherapies, and I was impressed by the level of activity that was seen there, much better than what was reported uh, two uh, meetings ago by Dr. Risby when he combined nivolumab with the many flavors of chemotherapy that were mostly of them steroids related. And uh, these combinations of anti pd one with uh, napaclitaxel and uh, carbopem without steroids were pretty impressive, well tolerated, good activity, so I agree. I mean, we. We are chasing a moving target, and, yeah. but anyhow, it's good news for the patient. I mean, new options, a completely new mechanism of action, and I don't think we have stressed enough that to the patients. What we do when we use chemotherapy or kinase inhibitor is continuous, continuous therapeutic pressure. And what the drug is doing is attacking your cancer cells. As soon as you stop the drug, the attack stops, and disease grows. Immune oncology, 
uh, through the immune checkpoints is completely different. What you are doing is raising an army from your own body. You are asking your lymphocytes to go to war against your cancer. And then, you know, once you kick the war, it might not be necessary to stay around forever. So we're going to have other discussions also about, is it worth it to give it six months, 12 months, or 24 right. months? Right. And this is going to have also its uh, financial implications. Right. We definitely need to clarify whether more is better, uh, mm -hmm. because many of us, we probably all have patients who have either had prolonged breaks or stopped treatment and then see still sustained responses long after you've stopped infusing the drug. Right.